Welcome to the Living Faith Missionary Church Podcast. You're about to listen to a message from Pastor Chris Starn, Senior Pastor at Living Faith in Yoder, Indiana. It is our prayer that this message is an encouragement and a blessing to your life. Well, good morning. It's good to be back. It was good to be away. Went to Vermont, a very green state, very beautiful state. But it's good to be back in God's house with God's people. If you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Isaiah. We are still in Isaiah. It will be for a while. You know, we live in a world of turmoil. We live in a world of struggles, of mass shootings, riots, pandemics, natural disasters, wars, etc., 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 we can go on and on. Our, our TVs, our emails, our computer screens, our phone screens, our, 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 our social media feeds are full of bad news. It's a daily barrage that we get from mainstream media and all media. Now, I remember, I remember that when, when, before media became such a big deal in our lives, as it is today, I, we were... It was, it was back, we were, we were air bombing Baghdad. We were bombing the city of Baghdad in Iraq. And there were two CNN correspondents, Bernie Shaw and, um, and Peter Arnett. They were stuck in the middle of Baghdad. And they were giving this blow by blow of the explosions they were seeing. This was the first time this had ever happened. And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden now everybody knew what CNN was. Before that, you know, you really, unless you had cable, and a lot of people didn't, you really didn't know. But these two men were later be called the boys of Baghdad. This was probably one of the early beginnings of a popular 24-hour news cycle. There is not a moment that goes by that you cannot get the news today. And it, it has, we, we've gotten this obsession with, with thinking that the more we know, the more we know. Problem is, where are we getting our information from? Before this time, what did we have to do? We'd have to wait until maybe the 5 o'clock news or the 10 o'clock news, or we'd have to wait until the newspaper landed on the front porch. In Fort Wayne, it was always the morning and the evening. But you had to wait for the news. You, you couldn't be up to date on everything every moment of the day. And guess what? We survived. Now, I wonder at times if this obsession that we have with media has been good or bad. There's some things that it's good, you know. We, 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 it could be good, but I, I, during COVID, I mean, that's what uh, people were just eating that up, eating the media up. And the problem was where the media was coming from. And what were they broadcast? Because what is the point? What is the point of a news service? What are they trying to do? They're trying to make money. They don't care what they, if they bring you the news or not. They need to make money. And the more sensationalized it is, the more advertisers will come because the more people who are watching. I did some research on some things. And, and if, if, you, if I remember when it first started, you know, when we first started, they started telling us about all the people who died from COVID, right? No. They started telling us about all the cases. Now, why would they tell the cases and not the people who have died? Because the case numbers were so much higher. The reality is, if you look at the, at the CDC's number, 0.03% of people in the United States passed away from COVID. Not with COVID, from COVID. Now, the media was sensationalizing everything, and we soaked it up. And we wondered why we have this this issue in our society today with all the mass shootings and the, and the depression and the suicides and the, and the killing, it's because we have been fed this doom and gloom and this, this air of, of, of trouble that's in this world. And it's constant. It's 24-7. Now, I want you to imagine what our news media would do if they had been around during the plague from 1346 to 1353, when actually 65% of the population died. How would they have sensationalized that? Or think about this. What if they had been around during the time of Isaiah? And they heard this prophecy that we're going to read today. How would they have used that? What would they have done? 
Now, there's no doubt that every death is a tragedy. But death is part of our humanity. Our world is in trouble. There's no doubt about it. Which the world has been troubled, and I've said this before, since the fall. If we look at John 16, 33, Jesus tells us, he says, you know, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. Not, not in the world. You're not going to find peace in the world. You will only find peace in Christ. And he says, because in the world you will have tribulation. You wonder why life is a struggle? You wonder why it's difficult? Why you get frustrated? That's why. We live in a world of tribulation. But he tells us, take heart. I have overcome the world. That's how we can find peace in Christ. When we, when we look at the events that are happening in our world today, as Christians, it's very easy for us to feel like we're in a riptide. If you know what a riptide is, a riptide, you really can't see it. But when the waves are coming in and they're sucking themselves back out in a riptide, it pulls you. And the best thing you can do with it, and you're caught in a riptide, is just go with the flow. Let it take you under. Try to get up and get some breath and let it take you under. You can't fight it. The more you fight it, the more it's going to fight you. It's kind of like if a lifeguard comes out to save you when you're in the, in the water. Don't fight them. Don't try to help them. Just let them help you. Go with the flow. But see, we feel like we're, we have no control over what's going on in our world today. We're in this riptide that's constantly turning us over. You know, death faces us every day. And what happens is, if we're not firmly in Christ, insecurity begins to bring it, come into us. We start to feel insecure about who we are and where we are and where we're at in this world. We, we love to think, we like to think that we're in control. But you know what? Control... Control is nothing more than an illusion. You and I have very, very little control. You know, most of us were not born of noble birth. None of us are really in a place of authority in our state or in our nation. You know, we, we can't put people in office. We, we, I mean, we vote and we believe that, you know, hey, we, can, we control who gets into office. I doubt that now. I'm not going to get into that. But I doubt very much if we really do control who gets into office. We're just average people. We're not kingmakers in this world. When it comes to what's occur occurring in this world, we, we normally will take a passive stance in it. We cannot stop what the, the path that this world is on. And I know that sounds very defeatist. The fact is that those in our governments and in our society who believe that they're in control truly are not in control. See, because you and I, what we need to do today and what everyone should do today is look to the one, more than ever before, we need to look to the one who is truly in control. And that's God. Let's go... And it's the same it's always been. Back in Isaiah's time, who was in control? God was in control. And what he's doing, he is revealing to Isaiah what he's going to do. So let's go to Isaiah 17, beginning with verse 1. Isaiah is going to share prophecy about what's going to happen to the nations around Israel. And this is what it says. It says, an oracle concerning Damascus. Damascus was the capital of Syria, like it is today. Syria was one of those nations that joined with the northern kingdom to come down and, and, and fight against Jerusalem and Judah. They were also fighting against the Assyrians. Not the, Syria and Assyria are two different places. It says, Behold, Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Arar are deserted. They will be for flocks which will lie down and none will make them afraid. The fortress will disappear from Ephraim. Now, now God has switched from Assyria and Damas Assyria and Damascus, and Ayr would have been this place over on the on the east side of the Jordan River. He has now switched to Ephraim, which is basically the northern kingdom, and he's talking about a fortress. Well, the fortress would be the capital of Samaria. 
It says, The fortress will disappear from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria will be like the glory of the children of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. What God says he will do, he will do. And in that day, the glory of Jacob will be brought low, and the fat of his flesh will grow lean. And it shall be as when the, the reaper gathers standing grain, and his arm harvests the ears, as when one gleans the ears of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Gleanings will be left in it, as, we're an, as when an olive tree is beaten. When they, when, when they would go in, if you know how they, they pick um, um, olives, they don't go in with like a, a cherry picker and get up in a bucket and start hand picking all these olives. I mean, the, thing, the tree is full of olives. I have a peach tree in our, in our yard that is full of peaches, and the peaches are starting to fall off because there's too many. And I can't imagine trying to pick them all by hand, but I'm going to try to pick as many. But what they would do is they take a stick, and they walk up to the tree, they lay down cloth, and then they beat the tree, and it would shake everything off. But there was always these ones at the top that would always stay. God is saying, there's going to be some gleanings left. Two or three berries in the top of the highest bough. Four or five in the branches of a fruit tree, declares the Lord God of Israel. See, what these verses are talking about is talking about the churning of the nations. The nations are caught in this riptide that God has placed there. Great powers are crashing into each other. Assyria is threatening from the north. Syria and Ephraim, or northern kingdom, is threatening the southern kingdom. Egypt is still down here and still a threat. Nations are bouncing against each other like they do today. Whether it's for drilling rights or gold or control over a piece of property. Can anybody say Ukraine? Nations will always fight against each other. Always. And you and I, we're like driftwood drifting on the top of the ocean, top of the water. All this churning going on underneath. We're on top of a turbulent sea, unable to do much about what's going on down there. Now, there's things we can and we should do. We should, we should care for the people who are, the innocents who are hurt. I'm going to be honest with you, I have a real problem sending all of our money over there to buy weapons. I, I don't like that. It is our money because it's the government sending it. You want to send money, send it to the Red Cross. You want to send money, you send it to the people who are doing, doing relief for the people who are hurt by it. That's what we should be doing. But we are just driftwood floating on the surface. Isaiah, later on, will find, in, much later when we get into chapter 57, which seems like a long way away since we're only in 17, but in 57 he says, But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and as waters toss up mire and dirt, there's no peace, says my God, for the wicked. There's no peace for the wicked. And our world is wicked. There's no doubt about it. So there's not going to be peace. Oh, we'll say it's peace. In fact, in, in prophecy of Revelation, it says at a time when people will be declaring peace, peace, in reality, there is no peace. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. God is sovereign over all nations. Nothing that is occurring in this world today is outside of his control. Things that are happening are falling into place because that's what he wants to happen. And even though we think, or nations, or I'll tell you, leaders think that they're the ones in control, the reality is they are playing right into God's hand. Satan himself thinks that he is doing his own thing when in reality, everything he does plays into God's hand. That's how awesome and amazing our God is. It is all happening as an extension of the plans that God has put in place for our world. What he started from the beginning, and we're all in the process of returning back to Eden. That's what's going to happen. He's redeeming us through Christ. It was the plan from the start. If you look at, if you go to Genesis 1, you say, and you read in the beginning, and God created the garden, and then you go to the end of Revelation, and you look at it, it seems like it's the garden again. God has taken us through this, and we have to walk through this turmoil to get there. That's why certain pastors will talk about, you know, have your best life now. Not me. <laughs> My best life is then, when that happens, not now. 
But God is sovereign. But what is the root? What is the root cause of all the struggles? Why are nations fighting against each other? We could sit there, we could say that it was because of all the oil, or because maybe because of the, the land that they want, or the, the ethnic conflict that's happening, which is part of what's happening in Ukraine, because you have the Russians and the Ukrainians, who were all Russian at one time, but now they forgot and they, they fight each other. Same thing, World War I and World War II were both started because of that, because of, because of family squabbles, to be honest with you, if you look at the history. But what is the root? What is whipping up the nations into a frenzy? Jesus' half-brother James tells us. He says in James 4, 1-3, through 3, he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Now I know, James is talking about individuals within the church. But understand, it, uh, people in the church are human. If you didn't know that, we are all human. And we all do the same thing. So the same thing we do in our churches, we do in our nations. When it comes to our humanity. And he says, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? He's telling us that inside of us, we are fighting against our passions. We are fighting against ourselves. So what happens? We fight against each other. You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have. Why? Because you do not ask. Oh, wait a minute, though. I've asked God to give me this. I've asked God to give me that. And James says, no, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. God is the giver of good gifts, but you're, if you're asking for something just because you want it and just because you feel you deserve it, you're not going to get it. And if you do get it, chances are it may not be as good as you thought it was because God may be trying to teach you something. If you ask God to help you love each other, if you ask God to, to if you pray for your children, I, I've already, Beth and I have already been praying for Caleb and Abigail's future spouses, especially Abigail's. I'm getting a look. God, God, God is going to do that because that's what God wants. That blesses him and that blesses us. But if I, if I ask God to make me rich, to enlarge my lands, and because I want it, it's not going to happen. Behind the turmoil and the rage, in reality, is actually the evil one, Satan himself. We saw back in chapter 14 of Isaiah, we saw where he was high and lifted up. He, was, he had a place of authority. It was beautiful. People, you know, we see this image of the horns and the tail. That's not him. That's not, that is from Dante's Inferno. That is from basically from media. Reality, he is an angel of light. He's beautiful. He was one of the most beautiful archangels there were. But his problem was he was ambitious. Too ambitious. Nothing wrong with ambition. I've been known to be ambitious in my day. Usually now, anymore, I'm too ambitious for the work I need to do, and I don't realize my body can't do that anymore, and I'm still, I do it anyways, because I'm ambitious. But he was ambitious to the point he wanted to take over God's throne. He had beauty and wisdom, authority, but it wasn't enough for him. He wanted more. See, his inside, even inside of him, his passions are fighting with himself. He wanted it all, and he attempted to usurp Yahweh's place. So what did God do? God threw him down here to earth. He no longer has access to the throne room of God. And now he is on a path of ultimate destruction. You know when that happened, I believe, see, I believe there's no place in Scripture where it says definitively when Satan was cast out of heaven. I believe it was at the cross. I believe it was at the cross. But it says in Revelation 12, 12, it says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Oh, because Satan is gone. He's out of heaven. The trouble, the bully is off the street now. He no longer lives in the neighborhood, so rejoice. But then what does it say? It says, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. You and I is who he's talking to. Humanity's fall at the garden. Because of that, because of what, what Adam and Eve did, we are now joined with the rebellion of Satan against God. So we too are on a course that can lead to our destruction. 
we know our time is short. And we can see the uproar. We can see it in the uproar of the nations. See, we're like, we're like children who, you know, we, we do something wrong, and what happens? Our parents discipline us. And we're mad because we're, we, we were disciplined, so what are we going to do? We go and we take it out on our brothers and sisters. Not that I ever did that. We take it out on each other. That's what's happening. Go back to the first murder when, when Cain killed Abel. What happened? He was mad because God didn't accept his offering. So what did he do? He killed his brother. Instead of lashing out at God, because God could handle it, and God would have chastised him, and, and his brother would have been alive, he lashed out at his brother instead. And that's what we do as nations. The writer of Psalm, Psalm 2, asked this question, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. His anointed, his Messiah. There's only one anointed. That's the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Do you ever feel like that's what our nation has done today? We've been listening, when we were traveling out to Vermont, we were listening to... Um, a, a, a CD from, um, I can't remember his name, his name's, his, um, I can't remember his name, but he, it was at a homeschooling conference that we went to. And he talks about how the nation has, it has tried to cast off God. But what happens? It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The turmoil of this world was the same back in the time of Isaiah. Isaiah says in these verses that Damascus is going to be destroyed. Now, imagine you live in Damascus and you, and you, do you think that it's going to be destroyed. None of us think that you know, our lives are going to be torn apart. None of us think that we're going to, be, to die tomorrow. We, we don't think that. We don't think about what our, what's going to happen, what could happen. They never could have imagined what was going to occur. At this time, Damascus was large. It was prosperous. There are two rivers that run through it. The Arbana and the Farpar. And actually, in 2 Kings 5.12, it says that those two rivers are much better than any river in Israel. These, this, this city had everything going for it. It had a future. It is the, Damascus is, is the longest continually inhabited city on the face of this earth. That's a picture of it, by the, by the way. Longest continually habitated city on the earth. Destined for greatness in the eyes of men. But in the eyes of God, it's going to be destroyed. Never to be lived in again. This begins to happen in 732 B.C. when the Assyrians come in and they destroy the city. It's, it's torn down, but there are some that are left. Remember, it said in Scripture that in, the, in, in Isaiah, it said that some of the gleanings from the top were still going to be there. There were still people there, but it laid in ruins for many years. It later becomes a, a small city in the Assyrian Empire. But see, many theologians believe that, that what we saw, what we saw in 732 with the Assyrians was just a a temporary, a, a partial fulfillment that one day this city right here will be leveled and will be gone. I believe that's going to happen. What's south of Syria? Israel. Who has nuclear weapons? Israel. They're not afraid to use them. I think Damascus is going to be destroyed. Just my opinion. Not a prophecy, just my opinion. But one day we know, because God says, it will be completely destroyed. The northern tribe of Israel, ten tribes called Ephraim, will suffer the same fate at the hands of the Assyrians. Now, these are still, this is the ten tribes. This is God's chosen people. He, he said he would protect them as long as they stayed him. Why are they going to be destroyed? Because they're just like the rest of the nations. 
They're no different. It breaks my heart today when I see pastors and see churches that are no different than the world. They allow, they, they allow sin into the church and, and actually don't just allow it in and don't, they don't call it out and say, hey, you need to stop this. What do they do? They celebrate it. Just like the man who was married to his stepmother that Paul had to address. He said, not only do you, don't only do, does it, you allow it in your church, you approve of it. Throw him out. Oh, can't do that. If I throw him out, I mean... Giving might go down. Seats might be empty. Yeah, because they need to be. Because you're not a church. They've become like the godless nations around them. I'm afraid the church today is going to struggle in the years to come to not become part of what the world is today. They're no different than the other nations. Back to Isaiah 17. Because he tells them, he tells them, this is why it's going to happen. He says, for you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, though you plant pleasant plants, so things look good, big churches, beautiful churches, and though you, sign, you sow vine branch of a stranger, though there may, they may grow on the day that you plant them and make them blossom in the morning that you sow, Yet the harvest will flee away in the day of grief and incurable pain. You know, we're going to go through it just like everything is fine. We're going to keep our going the way we are. We're going to plant. We're going to, things are going to look great. But in reality, it's all for nothing because God's going to come in and he's going to wipe them out. The root problem of these people, and I think the root problem today, is idolatry. That's the cause of God's judgment. And that's the cause of the coming judgment that we're going to see in our world, in our future. Now, idolatry, what, what is idolatry? Idolatry, idolatry we, we think of it when we look at it in the biblical terms. We think of idolatry as, you know, looking at this little idol, you know, or big idol if they're in the temple. They, they never, believe me, if you, study, if you study history, you know that they never really believed that the idol was the God. It was more of a way to channel the God, where if they felt that if they worshipped that God, that that God would indwell that little statue, and then they would get blessings because of it. But they never believed that that was the God. They knew it was made of stone, they knew it was made of wood, but it was, it was a tool that was used to channel the God. But it was worshipping that God. And when we worship something, what do we do? When we, especially when we, we, we worship something we create, we're, we're committing idolatry. And we exchange the glory of an eternal God for something that has no glory whatsoever. The reality is that there's only two religions, the worship of God and the worship of self. If you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping yourself. Plain and simple. And when we worship what we do we, and what we create, we got to be careful. we got to watch not to underestimate the power of idolatry. It's subtle. It has a huge significance in our world today. And you're like, wait a minute, Pastor. I don't know of anybody who has little idols. Well, actually, we stayed at a hotel in New York, and we walked in, and there was a little Buddha sitting there. And I explained to Beth that a lot of, your, a lot of people from Southeast Asia are, are buying these hotels and managing them, and they're bringing their Hinduism and the Buddhism into the, into the lobbies. But we say, but the problem is, is that's not what the problem in, the, in our U.S. today is not that we worship these little statues. It's that we worship ourselves. We worship what we do. If we are not genuine believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and the living God through faith in Jesus Christ, then we are idolaters. We either have true religion or we are idolaters. We worship created things, and many times we worship ourselves in the process. We struggle with idolatries of materialism or careerism or achievementism. achievementism. Church growthism is a huge idolatry in the church. Entertainmentism. I know some of these aren't words, but I made them up. And I'm writing the sermon, so I guess I can make them up. We have ism after ism in our lives. But it's nothing more than idolatry. And it is our idolatries that will cause us to come under the judgment of God. 
The whole system that we've created for ourselves here is empty. It is. It's empty. When God's judgment comes, and it will, just like it did for Damascus and just like it did for Ephraim, our system's not going to be able to save us. We can't, we can't, when, when God comes to judge us, we can't say, well, wait a minute, God, we've got this thing called the Constitution. I have all these rights. I mean, the Constitution's an awesome document. And when dealing with humanity, man, we need, to, we need to have it. But when we deal with God, the only thing we have is his word. Our systems are not going to save us. Jesus himself said it. In Matthew 7, he's talking to the people. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? There's a system. And did we cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? We did all this in the name of Jesus. I mean, did we do all that? He says, and then, well, I declare to them, this is the sad thing. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. These are people in the church who say, did, did we prophesy? Did, didn't I read my Bible? Didn't I go to church every Sunday? Didn't I sing? Didn't I sing in the choir? Didn't I sing in the band? Didn't I teach Sunday school? Didn't I get in the pulpit and preach? God will say, you never knew me. You never knew me. I don't care what you did in my name. You never knew me. It's kind of like when there were some men who were trying to, trying to cast out the demon, and, and they said, well, we, we, cast you, we cast you out in the name of Jesus, who Paul, who Paul professes. And the demon says, oh, I know Paul. I know Jesus, but I don't know you. And he, he kicked their behinds. Just to say that you go to church does not make you a believer. You have to know Jesus, and you've got to put him first in your life. As a world, we, we've rejected God as a world, as a nation, as a church, as a people. We go through, the, through our motions of faith without the foundations of the faith. What are you building your life upon? Is it upon the sand or is it upon the rock? The rock is Jesus Christ. That's what we need to build our life upon. God has accomplished so much through us as a nation and through us as, through us as people. But what do we do? We turn from God and we go our own way. And the result of our turning, go back to verse 10 and 11 again, it says, you've forgotten your God and your salvation have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, though you plant pleasant plants and sow with vine branch of a stranger, though you make them grow on the day that you plant them, I my gardens are growing, I love it. But it'll be nothing. And you make them blossom in the morning, yet the harvest will flee away in the day of grief and the incurable pain. But see, even in the midst of all of this, I don't know if you noticed, but I skipped over some verses. Because in the midst of this, we, we, we have a ray of hope because of the grace of God. Because judgment brings repentance brings the opportunity for repentance. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance, but judgment brings an opportunity for repentance. And this is what it says, go back to verse 7. It says, In that day man will look to his maker. We will look to God. And his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel is Jesus Christ. He will not look at the altars. We won't, we won't look at the altars, at the work of our hands. He will not look on what his own fingers have made, either the ashram, which were the ashram poles, which were the, another worship item, or the altars of incense. In that day, their strong cities will be like deserted places of the wooded heights and the hilltops. Basically, New York, Chicago, L.A., San Francisco, Fort Wayne, nothing. Level. Places of the wooded heights and the hilltops, which they deserted because of the children of Israel, Israel, and there will be desolation. See, what has happened here, God in his grace has shown us through Isaiah, through his word, the destruction that's going to come. We, we, we see that Damascus was destroyed. And we, do we think we, we deserve better than that? As a nation, as, as people, as a church, I hope that we do. I mean, I, I hope... I'm teaching you that we need to be firm on Christ. 
It's my goal. But unless we repent, the same judgment that happened to Damascus is going to happen to us. We look at what Isaiah prophesied about Damascus and about Ephraim, and we, we wonder, what does that have to do with us? I mean, these were, these were people back a long time ago, right? I mean, centuries ago. I mean, we would call them quaint today. No technology, you know, no social media, no CNN or Fox News, you know, common folk. Really, not really technologically advanced compared to us. They didn't have the modern day conveniences that we take for granted. Why do we care what happened to them a long time ago? In this bygone era, these bygone people, why does it matter? We'd be good to remember, first of all, that God is still holy. That hasn't changed. And we are still idolaters. He's not changed. And unless we repent, and we like our ways, we're going to perish like them. But in the middle of this is this ray of hope. In the middle of all the strife in the world, our only hope is Jesus Christ to look upon his Holy One. God can bring salvation for idolaters like us. But we have to turn, not, we have to turn away from the things that we've made, and we've got to turn back to God. We need to focus on God. We need to, we need to make sure that we, everything we do is based upon the gospel. I'm, I just wrote the script for my first video of, of Watchmen on the Wall, and it's about worldview. What is your worldview? Did you know, and I'll just give you a little preview here, did you know that a survey was done, and only 6% of those who call themselves Christian actually have a biblical worldview? If you, they'll say they're Christian, then you start asking them questions, and those questions will determine that they don't have a biblical worldview. Six percent, and that includes people in the church. I think people in the people who actually are part of a church, it's maybe eight percent don't have a biblical worldview. And I'll explain in that video what a biblical worldview. If you if you don't have the internet and you want a copy of it, I'll put it on DVD for you, or I'll put it on audio CD for you if you want to listen to it. Talk about what a what what is a how do we get back to a biblical worldview? Because if we don't, we're going to suffer the same thing that I, these people in a Damascus and Ephraim are to suffer. We have to turn away from those things, put away all the isms that we have in our lives, and we need to place our faith, our trust in the Holy One of Israel. Because one day, all this turmoil that's going on in this world, one day. It's all going to be quieted. Verse 12 says, Ah, the thunder of many peoples. They thunder like the thundering of the sea. Ah, the roar of the nations. They roar like the roaring of mighty waters. The nations roar like the roaring of many waters, but he, being God, will rebuke them. Just as Jesus stood up in the boat and said, Peace, be still, and the storm stopped, and the waters stopped, God is going to rebuke the nations and it'll be quiet. And they will flee far away, chased like chaff on the mountains before the wind and whirling dust before the storm. At evening time, behold, terror. Before morning, they are no more. This is the final judgment. This is the judgment of the nations. God says, in the morning, they'll be they'll be. They'll be Roaring like everything was going exactly the way they wanted to, and all of a sudden God's going to rebuke them, and by evening and by the next morning, they're gone. God takes care of it in less than a day. This is the portion of those who loot us and the lot of those who plunder us. He's, Isaiah is trying to tell Jerusalem and tell the Judahites, listen, God's going to do this. Don't worry. Everything that's going to happen to us is part of God's plan. It's going to work out because God is still in control. The nations will continue to roar and this world will continue to be in turmoil until Christ returns. It's going to happen. It's going to get worse. Believe me. And the question is, will that be in my lifetime? I certainly hope so. But if not, it's not. And I need to keep doing what God tells me to do. But during the time of the plague... Understand, people thought it was the end of the world. They really did. So we don't know for certain. I hope so. It seems that way. 
A time will come when the rebellion against God is going to be over. It's going to be done. And everything will be quiet and peaceful amongst the nations. Jesus is going to come. He's going to reign forever. And we will finally understand and experience what true peace is. But see, until that time happens, you and I, we, we, we get to get a taste of the peace. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to look to Christ, our Redeemer. We've need we got to look in faith now and see Jesus and have peace through Christ. But one day, we'll see Him with our physical eyes. For now, we see Him with our mind's eye. We see Him crucified. We see Him resurrected. We see Him coming again, reigning on His throne. But one day, we'll get to see Him another way. Revelation gives us a promise. Says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Those are the Jews. They will see Jesus. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Amen means so be it. Let it happen. So I urge you today, I urge you, to turn from the isms of your life, turn from the idols in your life. And, and, and I'm not saying we're all d decrepit, evil people. I'm saying there may be things that we're still hanging on to a little bit, our, our pride, our, our arrogance, our, our things. Take your eyes off of those and put your eyes on Jesus Christ. Look to him daily in faith so that your sins can be forgiven. Repent daily. It's not a matter of I repented once, now I don't have to do it again. It's a daily repentance. So that my sins are forgiven. The isms are out of my life. I'm, eyes are firmly planted on God. Let's pray. Thank you for joining us today. We hope this message was a blessing to you. If you're watching on YouTube, please like this video as it will help in spreading this message into the global online community. Please consider subscribing to our page so that you will receive notices when we post new messages. If you're watching this on Rumble, please hit the Rumble button for this video so that the gospel can be spread into the Rumble community. Also, consider subscribing to our Rumble channel. You can also listen to our podcast on Amazon Music and Apple Podcasts. We hope you have a blessed day.